Okay. Just a few other things. We should be done in 20 minutes or so. Um, so we have to just deal with uh, immune deficiency disorders. Now, we can either have primary immune deficiency disorders or secondary. Primary means you are born with them. Secondary, you got it from someplace. A good example of secondary immunodeficiency disorder, HIV. You got it from a pathogen that came into your body. Does that make sense? So there's four or five primary ones you need to know about. Okay? X-linked A gamma glomerulinemia. Mm. Let me also tell you too, if you ever see like a letter A or A N in front of, as a prefix in front of something, that means without or not. This gamma globulin is basically telling you immunoglobulin. It's antibodies, and it's in, in the blood. So basically it's saying no antibodies in the blood, or this person is just not producing antibodies. That's what this disease is. It's an X, X linked disease, which means who has it more? Males have it more? Females have it more, or it's equal equal? Females or males or equal? <coughs> yeah, uh, it's males. Males have it more. It's like muscular dystrophy. Okay, males have it a lot more. That's what the X link is. The reason why is because males only have one X chromosome. They have the Y. So if their X is screwed up, they have no other one to, to deal with. But you women have XX. So if one is screwed up, you've got the other one that'll be dominating. So that's what happens. The only way that you could actually get with X link and you could actually pass down a disease to a female is that the woman and the man have to, the man has to have the disease and the woman has to have the disease. Does that make sense? It's that's what happens with that. But it's it's very rare that women would get it. Okay. Um, it's also called Bruton disease, also, right? Like I said, a lot of different ways of saying the same thing. Um, so it's the X-link recessive disease. B cells just don't mature. They're there, they don't mature though. And if they don't mature, you're not going to make any antibodies. That's how this one works. Okay? The T cells are completely normal though. Okay? Um, symptoms, excess is simple. The symptoms appear at six months old. Why would they happen at six months old? Right. The mother's antibodies, IgG, cross the placenta, and the baby has, uh, has the protection for the next six months with those. Once they wear off after six months, that's it. Which is also a good reason why you should breastfeed, because you've got IgA. What's that? If they breastfeed. If they breastfeed, they'll get the IgA. Okay? However, it's still, remember, IgG and IgM are really the, the first and second ones to get in, in place. IgA is good but we want the other one. And we can give other ones, too. We could give uh, bags of um, immunoglobulin each month. But will it delay the presentation of that disease if they're breastfeeding? Well, the certain things, yeah. Because IgA, it's only going to go to the, the mucous areas. So they probably won't get much of, let's say, respiratory. They won't get much of the, because um, that's where it ends up going, so they won't get respiratory infections or GI, but other infections on the skin and stuff, they'll end up getting, right? Okay. Um, and they also, some of them will also have autoimmune diseases also. So it's putting that whole picture, trying to figure out uh, what's going on with that. Um, the treatment is, like I said, monthly uh, IV immunoglobulins. <coughs> Just every month for the rest of their life, they're going to be getting these. Isolated IgA deficiency. This is where only IgA is missing. All right. Um, <clears throat> this is second most common in immunodeficiency disease next to HIV. So this is pretty common. One in 700 Europeans have this. Uh, it's rare in African or Asian heritage. All right. But this is pretty common. Um, it's an autorecessive uh, defect. So men and women are equal on, on getting this. It's just that you have a decrease of IgA. I wouldn't say breastfeed your child until he's 50 years old. That's not doable. Okay. Um, but um, that's where that comes in. And if you get these recurrent GI and respiratory infections, you, where you would expect it to be if you don't have the IgA, right? Because that's in the nose, it's in the mouth, it's 
it's all we're mutating. It's important to know the the foundations of I of let's say of what you learned in A and P one and A and P two. To know where IgA is makes sense why you're getting certain disease or certain infection. It's in the mucous membrane. Okay. And autoimmune diseases are also pretty common with them too. Um, common variable in immunodeficiency. Basically, it's a group of immunodeficiency disorders, and I kind of abbreviate disorders with D slash O. Um, <clears throat> it's genetic. The problem is we just don't know where the gene is. We know that if it, it follows, uh, if, if your mother has this, or your sister has this, there's a good chance you will too. We just don't know where on the chromosomes it actually lies the gene for this. Um, and basically, the B cell um, is there, but it's not. It's just malfunctioning. And because of that, you have a decrease of uh, antibodies. And you get these infections, uh, staph, strep, hemophilus, and so forth. Um, and it's recurrent. Okay? Uh, and you may also get autoimmune diseases, uh, specifically rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Okay? Thymic hypoplasia. Basically, the thymus doesn't mature. B cells are fine. T cells, that's where it matures, as you just told me before, right? So it's also called the George syndrome, okay? And this is the thymus just doesn't develop in the embryo. And that's located, if you remember the thymus, it's found anterior to the heart. So it's right over here, okay? In children, you need this. In adults, you don't need it. So gradually, this thymus gets so small, by 50 years old, there's nothing there. It's useless in an adult. The reason why is because they're already mature. By, I mean, I'm not, not on here, I'm talking about a normal person, a right? healthy person like yourselves. What happens here is that your body, your thymus will mature the T cells, it releases hormones called thymosin, and will mature the, the, the T cells so that they're full-fledged lymphocytes, right? T cells, helper T cells, killer T cells. But remember, they're made, so now that you have a, a, a mature, you have a mature T cell, just do mitosis. That one cell could turn into two mature cells. Those two cells could turn into more. So it doesn't need the thymus anymore. So the thymus is only good as a child to mature them for the first time kind of thing. It takes like, you know, about a decade or so for them to do that. After that, it's useless. But in these children over here, they don't have any mature T cells. So they're going to have problems over here. All right? It's genetic, and again, we don't know where it is on the DNA where that a gene is, and it's basically your T cells, they're malfunctioning because they can't mature. Okay? B cells, on the other hand, are normal. Remember, they mature in the bone marrow. B for bone marrow. B for thymus. Alright? Usually, because it's over here, it's in the area of where your thyroid and parathyroid is. We notice that if there's no thymus there in an embryological development, that there's ways and there's there's these brachial arches and so forth. I don't want to go into details of it. But because there's no thymus there, we also see in most people, they also don't have a parathyroid either. I mean, there's, there's a few parathyroid. There's, there's two or three on either side of the, of the thyroid. But they don't develop either. So if there's no parathyroid development, what are they going to have a hard time controlling? What substance? What do parathyroids do? Ends with alcyon. <laughs> Still no answer? Iodine, no, no. <laughs> calcium, right, calcium. All right? So parathyroid hormones will increase calcium. So they're going to have problems controlling calcium. Okay? Um, they also could have anomalies too. They got facial features that are uh, abnormal too. Because, again, it's in that whole area of the embryological development and things could happen over there too. The ears are low or the nose or the face or something is different. All right. And also their heart too. It's all in that same area. So they get these recurrent infections, special virus, especially viral, fungal, and protozoan. Okay. It's lymphocytes do those kind of things. All right. And thymus, the thing is thymus transplant is effective in only some patients. I don't know why it's not effective in all patients. Maybe because of the rejection and stuff that can occur. I don't know. But that's what, what's going on with that. All right. Severe combined immunodeficiency. This is where both B cells and T cells are affected. Your whole immune system is pretty bad. All right. This is the bubble boy. OK. 
Okay? This is SCID, Severe Combined Immune Deficiency. <clears throat> it's a group of inherited di disorders, <coughs> and like I said, many different genetic de defects can be uh, identified here. Some are X-linked, some are autosomal recessive, but in all the cases, all the T cells and B cells, there's something wrong with their function. Either they're both not being made, or they're made, but they're just not functioning, but both uh, uh, branches, the B cells and T cells, don't function on this. Uh, <clears throat> the, thym the thymus and lymphoid tissue are usually underdeveloped. Okay, symptoms appear before six months because they don't have, even if you have IgG from mom, where are they going to attach to? There's no T cells. You see what I mean? So they start getting problems early, okay, before six months. Um, <clears throat> and they get a lot of opportunistic infection. <clears throat> Basically, you've got to put them in strict isolation, away from any kind of infection. All right, and that's where you got this bubble boy, right, kind of thing. Um, until we can get a bone marrow or stem cell uh, transplant. Okay? Miscellaneous um, diseases of immunology, not including HIV. That's a separate section after this. Uh, but I want to do them as some few. I think there's three or four over here that you should know. Uh, lymphoma. Um, lymphoma is a cancer of the lymphocytes that are located in the lymph nodes. LN is lymph nodes. Um, so it's a cancer that the primary site is in the lymph nodes, given the word lymphoma. Okay? It's derived from the lymphocytes and the lymph, uh, lymph nodes that form solid tumors in the lymph nodes, and then later on they go into the bone marrow. Right? The M is bone marrow. This is not metastases. And metastases is where cancer spreads to from its primary site. So, in other words, if you have, let's say, a cancer of the breast, and that's the primary site, and then it spreads to the lymph nodes in the axillary area, the armpit, um, you now have cancer in the lymph nodes. That is not lymphoma. That's breast cancer that went to the lymph nodes. What I'm talking about is lymphoma is that it begins in the lymph nodes and then it goes elsewhere, okay? So it's not a metastasis, it's not a spread from other, some other place, it begins in the lymph nodes, okay? And we have two types, there's Hodgkin uh, lymphoma and there's non-Hodgkin lymphoma, okay? Non-Hodgkin lymphoma, also referred to as Hodgkin's disease, okay? This usually affects young adults. We're talking about between 15 and 25 years old, but it can also occur. We see it also uh, another place of uh, uh, majority of people getting hit with this uh, uh, disease is usually in the elderly, like 60 years old and plus. So we have what we call a bimodal. There is going to be, um, if we have, let's say, an age group over here, um, uh, so people with Hodgkin's disease over here increase amount, and we have uh, the age over here, we're gonna see, let's say, people with, let's say, here's 50 years old, here's 30, here's 45, here's 60, and here's um, 75 years old, we're gonna see a lot more happening over here, and a lot more happening over here. So we say bimodal, there's two modes, there's, um, you see, don't get me wrong, we do see some at 45 years old, um, but not as much. You usually see a lot more at these two age groups. Um, the diagnosis that happens with Hodgkin's lymphoma, usually the diagnosis is found in an early stage of the cancer. Okay? Um, now, what's what we call pathognomonic, when they take a biopsy, when the pathologist takes a, or a doctor takes a biopsy of the lymph node, questionable to see if there's lymphoma there. If they put on a microscope and they see a certain type of abnormal B cells, right? So these are lymphocytes um, that are B cells and they're found in lymph nodes and they're abnormal. They have a very classic uh, feature. Um, they're called Reed Sternberg cells. They kind of look like owl eyes. I'll show you what that looks like. But if the cells have these Reed Sternberg cells, there is no question about it. We say that it's pathognomonic. If you see the lymph nodes having Reed Sternberg cells, 
it is absolutely 100, 25%, 100% that this is Hodgkin's disease or Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay? It's not non-Hodgkin's, it's nothing else. So these Sternberg cells are specific to Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay? Um, symptoms of Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma, they're kind of um, vague. They get painless lymphadenopathy, usually in the neck though, okay? Um, but it's painless in large lymph nodes. They also may get a spleen that's enlarged. It's a fancy word. We say splenomegaly. Spleno means spleen. Megaly means enlarged. So they, by examination, um, when they do an abdominal examination, they will notice that the spleen is enlarged. Okay? Um, they may get these vague um, symptoms also. Fever, weight loss, night sweats, and itchiness. Um, so any of this can be signs of that. The prognosis is better than non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which I'll talk about in a moment, okay? 90% of people who are diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma survive more than five years. That's pretty good odds, okay? And it's the reason why that's contributing to a good, better prognosis is because it's usually diagnosed at an early stage, maybe stage one cancer or something like that. And when it's early in the stage, uh, it's more conducive to dealing with treatments. So that's what happens. That's why Hodgkin's lymphoma generally is, I don't want to say the better of the two, because you don't want to have cancer uh, no matter what, but it's the lesser of the two evils, if you want to call it that, okay? Um, so this is the Reed Sternberg cell, the abnormal B cells that happen, okay? These are normal cells, B cells that are over here, but when you have this cell that's enlarged, it kind of looks like owl eyes, you see that over there, um, that that's an ideal, and you see that in, in uh, uh, biopsy of the lymph node, uh, that is Hodgkin's lymphoma, no question about it, we say that the Reed Sternberg cell is pathognomonic for uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. It is 100% only found in Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it's just showing the same thing. There's normal B cells, but here's those owl eyes that you're seeing over the Reed Sternberg um, cell. Okay. So let's talk about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, also known as lymphosarcoma. All right. There's about 60 or 70 different uh, types of lymphoma without the Reed Sternberg cells thus giving the name non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay? It affects older adults, usually 60 years old, but it does affect all ages, but we see a bigger per percentage of them happening in elderly people. Um, but the bad part is, is that it usually is diagnosed at a later stage uh, of cancer. Uh, and because of that, they usually have a poorer prognosis than Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, the symptoms is painless lymphadenopathy, similar to what we just saw with Hodgkin's, but they usually, the lymph nodes that are affected can happen anywhere throughout the whole body, not just the neck. Don't get me wrong, Hodgkin's lymphoma it concentrates more in the lymph nodes in the neck, but it can occur anywhere else, but we see a majority of them happening in the neck, all right? Um, and the other systemic manifestations vary depending on what subtype. I'm not going to ask you about the different subtypes of non-Hodgkin's. It's way over the scope of this course. But understand the difference between non-Hodgkin's versus Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay? And understand the prognosis. All right? So another one that we have is multiple myeloma. Okay? Multiple myeloma um, is a cancer of the plasma cells. So B cells are okay, but B cells become plasma cells. And once it becomes a plasma cell, it produces antibodies. So this is a cancer of the plasma cells. Not of the B cells that were prior to it becoming a plasma cell, but of the plasma cells themselves. Okay? Now one of the classic things that we do see that happens in the urine is that they have what we call bent Jones protein. Um, they're abnormal immunoglobulins, antibodies that are detected in the urine. And that's what happens. When you see these bent Jones proteins in the urine, you could almost classically understand that it's multiple myeloma on there, okay? It's 
symptoms is that they get anemic, all right? They're very tired. They're more susceptible of getting infections because there is that, um, because of the, um, the plasma cells not producing um, the antibodies to help fight the, uh, the infections. And they also get many fractures, okay? Uh, and this is usually due to hypercalcemia from destroyed bone. The bone itself um, gets destroyed, okay? Um, the, the B cells are made in the bone marrow. That's why the B stands for bone marrow, where T cells are made in the thymus, um, are matured in the thymus, so that's why it's called T cells. So what happens is the cancer uh, affects the B cells, not the B cells, but it affects the, uh, the plasma cells that are actually made in the bone marrow, but eventually it's going to start affecting the, uh, the bone itself, the skeletal tissue itself. When the, the, uh, the bone itself gets destroyed, that releases a lot of calcium into the bloodstream. When it does that, it's going to make the bone more fragile, more brittle. So that makes it more prone to getting fractures. Uh, basically, it uh, becomes more like a, styrofoam, uh, like a styrofoam bone as opposed to a cement bone because more styrofoam and styrofoam breaks easily uh, than, than it does with cement. So that's what happens with multiple myeloma, okay? And mononucleosis um, is caused by a virus, okay? This is also the one we see quite often in colleges, and um, uh, usually in colleges, teenagers usually get this. Um, this is a kissing disease because it, it does get passed from uh, person to person through the saliva. Um, so we sometimes refer to it as a kissing uh, disease or just simply mono, okay? Uh, but it's caused by a virus, the Epstein-Barr virus, um, and um, it usually, like I said, adult that has contracted virus through the saliva from another. So kissing is a good example of that, okay? Um, they will most likely get lymph adenopathy, enlarged lymph nodes, um, they may get fever and fatigue. Uh, but for viruses, most cases, as you learned in microbiology and when we talk about most cases of uh, any kind of infection due to viruses, there isn't antibiotics to help that, okay? Um, so the treatment for mononucleosis is simply rest. There is no antibiotics given to this, uh, and hopefully in a week or two, uh, your body will um, uh, destroy what it needs to do with the cells that are infected with the, the virus and uh, deal with that, okay? Um, also, too, later on, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, Epstein-Barr virus. That also causes certain cancers, too, so just keep that in mind. But I don't want you to think that mononucleosis is going to cause cancer. It's a different um, strain of the uh, Epstein-Barr virus, okay? All right, the last thing I want to do is AIDS, okay? There's no way you can talk about the immune system and not talk about AIDS. It's just not going to happen, all right? So HIV the human immunodeficiency virus. This has a, let me show you what actually has happened. It's transmitted through the bodily fluids, as you know. A lot of stuff you should know about, right? Because it's probably one of the biggest diseases out there to know. And the way it works is this. Here you have a T4 cell, right? A helper T cell, okay? And you have, now I'm going to show you this. I don't mean to make light of this because it's not a light subject, not a funny subject or a simple subject. But for you to understand it, I'm going to draw a picture that this virus looks like Mickey Mouse. Okay, so just bear with me with that. It looks like Mickey Mouse. Okay? And like I showed you before, this has DNA in here. Okay? It's going to put the DNA into here. Right? So it's going to put the DNA into here. So there it goes into there. Okay? Just the way we've always learned it. Then this cell is going to spit out more of these HIV viruses. But here's what happens. They look like Mickey Mouse here. But they look like... Uh, I can't remember. So Donald Duck. <coughs> Donald Duck over here. So you have another Donald Duck over here. Think about this Donald Duck, I don't know. This is 
eye. Right? Donald Duck over here. Donald Duck over here. So what I'm saying is, this is why we're not going to find, a, why I believe there's not, they're not going to find a vaccine for HIV. The DNA is the same. That DNA is the same that's here, that's in here, that's in here. But the outside of the cell, or the outside of the virus, looks totally different. So if they make a vaccine to make it look like, you know, attack anything that looks like Mickey Mouse, fine, it'll work. But it's spitting out Donald Ducks. And that Donald Duck can go into another cell and spit out something that kind of looks like uh, Pluto. I don't know, something like that. Right? So now you say, oh, I want it to look like Donald Duck. I'm going to you know, make a vaccine to attack it. Well, now it looks like Pluto. It mutates. The cell mutates. The outside of the cell looks different. The antigens are always going to look different. And that's why it's going to be very difficult to find a vaccine for this. We have treatments, but we don't have cures. Is that clear about that? All right, it mutates. <coughs> so symptoms appear in a few months to 10 years. Okay? Targeting HIV replication. The replication of HIV-1 is a multi-stage process. Each step is crucial to successful replication and is therefore a potential target of antiretroviral drugs. Step one is the infection of a suitable host cell, such as a CD4 positive T lymphocyte. Entry of HIV into the cell requires the presence of certain receptors on the cell surface. CD4 receptors and co-receptors such as CCR5 or CXCR4. These receptors interact with protein complexes which are embedded in the viral envelope. These complexes are composed of two glycoproteins, an extracellular GP120 and a transmembrane GP41. When HIV approaches a target cell, GP120 binds to the CD4 receptors. This process is termed attachment. It promotes further binding to a co-receptor. Co-receptor binding results in a conformational change in GP120. This allows GP41 to unfold and insert its hydrophobic terminus into the cell membrane. GP41 then folds back on itself. This draws the virus towards the cell and facilitates the fusion of their membranes. The viral nucleocapsid enters the host cell and breaks open, releasing two viral RNA strands and three essential replication enzymes. Integrase, protease, and reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase begins the reverse transcription of viral RNA. It has two catalytic domains, the ribonuclease H active site and the polymerase active site. Here, single-stranded viral RNA is transcribed into an RNA-DNA double helix. Ribonuclease H breaks down the RNA. The polymerase then completes the remaining DNA strand to form a DNA double helix. Now integrase goes into action. It cleaves a dinucleotide from each three prime end of the DNA, creating two sticky ends. Integrase then transfers the DNA into the cell nucleus and facilitates its integration into the host cell genome. The host cell genome now contains the genetic information of HIV. Activation of the cell induces transcription of proviral DNA into messenger RNA. The viral messenger RNA migrates into the cytoplasm, where building blocks for a new virus are synthesized. Some of them have to be processed by the viral protease. Protease cleaves longer proteins into smaller core proteins. This step is crucial to create an infectious virus. 
two viral RNA strands and the replication enzymes then come together and core proteins assemble around them, forming the capsid. This immature viral particle leaves the cell, acquiring a new envelope of host and viral proteins. The virus matures and becomes ready to infect other cells. HIV replicates billions of times per day, destroying the host's immune cells and eventually causing disease progression. Drugs which interfere with the key steps of viral replication can stop this fatal process. Entry into the host cell can be blocked by fusion inhibitors, for example. Inhibition of reverse transcriptase by nucleoside inhibitors or by non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors is part of standard antiretroviral regimens. The action of integrase can be blocked. Protease inhibitors are also part of standard antiretroviral therapy. Each blocked step in viral replication is a step towards better control of HIV disease. Um, the routes. Should know this too. All right, it's changed over the decades, but. The sexual transmission is the number one cause of HIV. Worldwide, the most common cause, MCC, most common cause worldwide is heterosexual contact. In the United States, the most common cause is homosexual contact. That doesn't mean heterosexuals don't get HIV in America. I'm just saying the most common. Okay? So, we can do it this way. We can also pass it through parental, in other words, through the IV or through some kind of needle. So intravenous drug use, blood transfusions, even accidental needle sticks that if you're working into a hospital, you may get stuck with a needle, you may get stuck with a, with a scalpel if you're going to do help with surgery. And what it is is that one in 300 needle sticks, accidental needle sticks, has HIV in it. What does that mean? If you get stuck 300 times throughout your lifetime, one is going to be positive. Okay? That's about a point, I think it's, if I do my percentage, I do 0.3%. Okay? Am I doing the math right? 0.3%? Okay. Um, perinatal, where it passes from mom to baby, that does happen. All right? Also, it does pass through the breast milk, too. Now, I'm a big fan of having breastfeeding go on because you got formula, and how much is formula nowadays? Do you know? How much is it a month, or how much is it a week? $20, $30? Yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot. And breast milk, how much is that? Sure. Yeah, you see? Okay. Um, so there's that, plus you learned about the IgA, right? That goes, the, the uh, antibodies goes through there. You have the mother-baby uh, contact. Um, I know it's kind of difficult for some women to do that, um, but keep in mind, we've been doing it for eons, and that's why the breasts are there for the baby, right? Um, so there's the problems with latching and stuff. That's another talk for another time if you want to do that. But I'm just saying there's a lot of big uh, pros to be doing that. And, uh, but only th the only thing that I would say definitely you can't breastfeed for is if mom has HIV, it will be past the baby. All right. The other thing is if mom's a drug user, we don't want those drugs to go to baby. Those are really one or two, or if the mother's getting some kind of chemotherapy, like there's certain kind of medications that do get passed through there too. But for the most part, breastfeeding, there's too many pros when you compare it to the cons. Okay? So anyway, that's what that is. All right. And like I said, breastfeeding. All right. Um, <coughs> that's our little culprit. That's what the HIV looks like. Okay? Now the antigens you can't see is very microscopic, but those things would change on it. But that's our HIV virus. Okay? <clears throat> um, 
So HIV replication, I kind of explained that to you over here with a Mickey Mouse Donald Duck scenario, but that's written up here, okay? And um, they use a, an enzyme called um, reverse transcriptase. I'm not going to ask you about that. When you take microbiology, you learn more about this. But just keep in mind that the, there's a high mutation rate that goes on with this, going from Mickey Mouse to Donald Duck. And because of that, a cure is virtually going to be impossible unless they could find some way that they could resolve this or, or, or kill this area. You know what I'm saying? In terms of like, this, if they could catch on to how they can stop this from changing, yes. But it's going to be very difficult to find a cure for this. Mm -hmm. I don't remember like the details, but there was an article, I think, like a year or two ago, where they were saying that... Switzerland, right? Something like that, but it didn't cure HIV, they just like kind of deactivated all the virus cells in the body so it cured the symptoms even though the HIV was still mm -hmm. in their body. We're getting better with medications. I'm going to talk about that too. We're getting better with medications, but we have people living with HIV for like 25, 30 years. Beginning in the 80s, we see a lot of people dying. You've seen all the, if you were living then, you learned all the, about the celebrities that were dying of HIV and AIDS. Uh, Freddie Mercury from the, the group of uh, Queens, the Liberace, the piano player, Rock Hudson was a big one, with a movie star, um, and they were just dying very fast. But now with the new medications that are out, um, there's no cure for it, but what they're doing is extending life. Um, but you could imagine that even with HIV, you're going to have um, some issues with relationships, you know, and, and talking about that. It's, it's definitely a social um, a social issue that you got to deal with with that, and uh, it just becomes a part of your life if you're born with it because mom gave it gave it to the, the baby. That's the only life they know. So um, there's some issues there. But research has getting better and better and better. But the problem they have is this thing where it keeps on mutating about this. All right. Um, <clears throat> so what is AIDS? HIV is the virus. AIDS is what it actually would cause. So this is called uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. If you destroy the T4 cells, the helper T cells, your immune system is going to go down. If your immune system is going to go down, you're going to be very. It's going to be very difficult for you to fight even the common cold. Okay. So you would have someone that's immunocompromised. Right? An immunocompromised patient is a patient where the immune system is compromised or declined. So do make sure you know the difference between immunocompromised versus immunocompetent. Right? An easy, you know, easy mix-up between the two, but they're complete opposites. Someone who's immunocompromised, their immune system is down. Someone is immunocompetent, I would hope everybody in this room is immunocompetent, that their immune system is way up to par, okay? So, like I said, they can die from chicken pox or just a common cold, depending on how much of the numbers of the helper T cells have gone down. So AIDS develops slowly, you got phase one. And what happens here, it may last a few weeks to a few years. It's different for each person and the variant of the HIV. It may start off as a brief period of just flu-like vague symptoms, all right? Swollen lymph nodes, chills, fevers, fatigue, uh, body aches. Um, it's almost like you're taking A and P and that's how you're feeling, right? It's that vague kind of thing that's happening. And most people don't exhibit recognizable symptoms. They don't realize that that's what's, what's happening with them. They've got a runny nose or something like that. But in the meantime, the virus is multiplying, okay? Um, and antibodies are made but are ineffective uh, for the complete virus re removal. It's just because it keeps changing. So they make an antibody for this, and now we've got to make an antibody for this. Another antibody that makes it look like Pluto and Goofy and so forth. So your body's always making antibodies for something that won't exist anymore because it, it, the virus keeps on mutating. Okay? Then we have phase two. And phase two is the thing where opportunistic infections are going to happen. This occurs during between six months to ten years. You have bacteria all over your body. If you don't think that you have bacteria on your skin, even when you wash your hands, you're fooling yourself. You're loaded with bacteria. 
in fact, in your mouth, in the vagina, on your hand, all over the place, in your intestines, everywhere, okay? But we have good bacteria and we have bad bacteria that's in there. What's nice is that the good bacteria is keeping down the bad bacteria. But if the good bacteria start flourishing, or not flourishing, but start diminishing, then the bad bacteria is going to get higher and higher, and it's going to cause some disease in your body. This is, so this bad bacteria has the opportunity to cause mayhem in your body. So we call these opportunistic infections. So it's normal flora, it's normal bacteria that's in your body, but that's okay because the good bacteria is keeping it down. But if the good bacteria goes down, then the numbers of these bad bacteria are going to flourish and they're going to set some things, you know, causes diseases. Okay? Um, if you leave it untreated, 95% will progress to the next phase, which is called AIDS. Okay? This is where we got phase three, this is clinical AIDS. The helper T cell numbers have got down to less than 200 um, cells per millimeter of Q, uh, Q, okay? It's very, very low, all right? It's less than that. The opportunistic infections and cancers are gonna start getting higher and higher and higher. That's why when we see people with tuberculosis, one of our biggest concerns is that their immune system has gone down. Could be because it's corticosteroids, could be that they're just getting older, because as we get older, our immune system goes down, like 85 years old. Or someone who's 30 years old, where their immune system should be up, our other concern is that, is there HIV in here? Pneumonias, meningitis, all right, encephalitis, which is an uh, infection of the brain, uh, Carposi sarcoma. You ever seen that movie with Tom Hanks, uh, Philadelphia? I think it's called Philadelphia, where he plays a, an HIV uh, uh, patient. And he had all these big black marks that were happening on his skin. And they would disappear and come back in a different area. Those were Carposi sarcoma, which is basically a cancer, all right, sarcoma is a cancer of blood vessels. And they would come up and they start invading and then disappear and then they would here someplace else. It's got a weird feature like that, and that's Car Carposi sarcoma. You never see that. I've, I've only heard about that when your immune system is extremely low. So I wouldn't say Carposi sarcoma is synonymous, synonymous with someone who's got HIV, but it's right there, all right? Because it's got to have your eight year helper T cells have got to be very low, okay? And if left untreated for this phase three, it's usually fatal. So what's happening here over the years, okay, so this is years after infection, this is uh, helper T cell in the body, all right, you can see here that this is T cells, the orange here, the T cells are going down. HIV in the blood would then go up because the helper T cell, think about it, the, if, if your viruses in the blood are going to destroy all your helper T cells, the, it, it, they're indirectly proportional, right? The numbers of viruses go up, your helper T cells will go down. Does that make sense? Okay. And the antibodies, just because your immune system, you make a lot of them because you have all this, um, uh, you have all these viruses in it, it's going to go up, but then it'll also go down too because your immune system is just going to go down. Remember, keep in mind, What's going to activate, this is going back to what we've been talking about, what activates B cells to make antibodies? Interleukin-2, which comes from helper T cells. So if you don't have helper T cells, you're not going to make interleukin-2, which means it's not going to make B cells to turn into plasma cells to make antibodies. It's all put together, okay? <coughs> So treatments, and like I said, newer medications are coming out. There's not a 100% cure, but they are making people live a lot longer like this. Um, as long as the patients are taking their medications. 
And you can see, getting to the medical field, that there's a lot of people out there that are just non-compliant. They don't want to take their medication. Uh, either it's too much money, which we have to have our government step in here and make sure that the medic you know, medications are given to them, or they're, you know, they just don't like the side effects of certain things. Okay? Um, so we have patient compliance that's going on here. Uh, and making sure that they do go to the doctor to get the prescriptions for these medications. All right? Now we've got this whole Obamacare thing. Now everybody's covered. They should be seeing the doctor. But a lot of times, even my father, he not has HIV, but he knew there was something wrong with his foot. He's a diabetic. It turned into this black mummified toe. He knew something was wrong. He waited a long time before he saw the doctor. You see what I mean? We see a lot of people, more, much more than what you're, you, you think about. Okay? It's just that, you know, you have, I guess the most common reason is either uh, I have no time to see the doctor, or it's not bad, I'll just uh, go on like, like this. Does that make sense? So as long as they get the medications, and they take the medications, then, you know, the treatments are pretty good. They last, you know, at least we have people living it for like 25, 30 years. But there is no cure to it. So this is where if you're going into the medical field, you've got to push the compliance of the patient to do this. Okay? Um, so preventative spread is really the only way we can actually, uh, the only way we can do this is education. Right? Condoms and things, uh, and, and just educating um, that these are the ways that you can get this. All right? Breastfeeding and, and sex and things like that. So education is the only preventative measure that we can do. Because like I said, once you have it, that's it. You can't get it back. You can't try and stop it. You, it's just there. Okay? So that's why I always say start uh, educating your friends and family and, and even strangers. If you, you know, like, technically, you're strangers to me. So I'm spreading the word, you know what I'm saying? So that we can just give it, you know, and just make it extend further and further. Okay? So, <clears throat> and you can see here, um, deaths were very high up until mid-90s. And then it's been coming down. It's because of the newer medications. We have people here living with AIDS. It's much higher here in 2009, and it's even going higher now. But they have it. You can't get rid of it. Okay? 